Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you just heard, I'm going to be talking about the uh, QV50 CubeSat network. Um, Lars has actually got a slightly different but related uh, topic of the Genso Test Sat, and we're going to have uh, 20 minutes each. So, um, the QB50 network, uh, some of you may have heard of, some of you haven't, so I'm going to give a little summary at the beginning. Um, but uh, in particular, I'm a member of the Ground Station Network and Frequency Allocation Working Group, which is quite a mouthful, as you can see. Um, and this is the context that, that we're working in. So a little summary of QB50. So the idea is it's an international network of 50 CubeSats for multipoint in situ measurement in the lower thermosphere and the upper mesosphere. Um, this is uh, often called the ignorosphere because it's too high for planes and balloons, but it's too low for spacecraft. So there's actually very, very little research. The only research really done on it is from sounding rockets that pass through it at breakneck speed, of course. So they call it the ignorosphere. And the idea is that uh, we're going to have CubeSats that, uh, that are uh, on purpose on a short mission. So they're only at uh, 300 kilometers altitude and expected to, to deorbit through drag within just three months, um, but have 50 of them and by this time spread out around the orbit and be tracking them all the way down until they burn. The uh, uh, coordinators of this are the Von Kármán Institute uh, in Brussels, and at the moment it's quite a preliminary stage. Um, so there's a, a lot of people very, very interested and uh, doing some work on it already, but they haven't got the primary funding yet. Uh, that's expected towards the end of the year. There's been an application to the EC for quite a significant amount of, amount of funds, and it looks like they're going to get it. Um, so at the moment, they've uh, split us up into three working groups. There's the sensor selection working group, the orbital dynamics working group, and the ground station and frequency coordination working group. Um, quite a mouthful, as you can see. Uh, the other two basically do exactly what it says on the tin, as you'd expect. Um, now, we're a little bit uh, out of sync, perhaps, because the sensor selection working group at the top there, they've already had four meetings and basically selected their sensors um, before we'd even had one meeting. Um, so it's a little bit out of sync, but we'll get to the uh, ramifications of that later. Now, the, so the GFWG, which is much easier to say than the whole uh, acronym, um, you can see the list of members here, uh, not too many surprises and quite a few uh, familiar names. Um, so just in the, in the room here we have uh, uh, Graham and Lars and myself of course, and uh, we have uh, Wouter and we have Stefano. And, um, but there's quite a lot of uh, uh, more international uh, partners as well. So the problem is where to start because we basically have been given the same requirements I just gave you. That's, that's how detailed and formal it's got so far. <laughs> and we're told to coordinate the frequencies and to sort out the, the, the ground station network. Um, and without any requirements, of course, that's really difficult. We don't know what the data budget needs to be. We don't know how much data the scientists need to get down. The deployment scheme isn't yet very well defined. Um, and of course, coordinating 50 frequencies is, is going to be a bit of a nightmare. Um, just an example, of course, the sensor selection working group. I'm sure the scientists would like to have megabytes of data being taken every minute from all of the CubeSats and downloaded. They're going to have all these, these desires and requirements on the data budget that need to be fed through to, to us so we can try and find solutions, and then we're going to give them the constraints as a result of, uh, of, of our work, and we need to find this iterative loop to some system engineering. But this doesn't exist yet in the project. Um, so just uh, looking at the actual spectrum that's, that's available, um, in the VHF spectrum, of course, we've got a couple of hundred kilohertz, but it's already used. In, uh, in, in UHF, there's perhaps, perhaps one megahertz bandwidth available. Um, but given that uh, each of the CubeSats are going to need something like 50 kilohertz um, wide, uh, you can already see that they don't fit into uh, 1,000 kilohertz. So there's going to be some overlap. There's going to need to be some, some uh, multiplexing. Uh, there's, there's various different schemes we're going to have to look at to try and deal with this. Because um, as you start to go up to, up to uh, 2.4 gig, um, there's loads of spectrum, of course, but you've got all the interference risks and 
very difficult to do S-band on a CubeSat. Typical CubeSat constraints, if we imagine, uh, we go through this very quickly, you're all very familiar with it, if we imagine a typical LEO CubeSat, you've got about one watt of transmission power, most of them are on 1K2. Um, we're in such a low orbit for QB50, you're only going to have six or seven minutes per pass at, at the maximum. Um, so you can maybe, if you're optimistic, you can maybe talk about 75 kilobytes a day, and that's quite optimistic, really, if you look historically at how CubeSats have actually uh, managed to do. And the commissioning often takes one or two weeks, and that's, that's a sixth of the mission of QB50. You can't take two weeks to commission these CubeSats. Um, which leaves us something like five megabytes per CubeSat in total, being optimistic, which would be 250 megabytes for the entire QB50. And the sensor selection working group, of course, want this per day. Uh, it's <laughs> per orbit, okay, per orbit. Clearly, we need to make some improvements. So possible improvements. Ground station networking is the first one that we're going to look at. Um, we can also talk about band selection, about modulations, about error correction, wideband receivers, and I'll run through them all. So, not going to go into too much detail about Genso because you heard the excellent presentation from uh, Phil Beavis yesterday. But you know the, uh, the, the, the drill, the idea of uh, taking um, dozens or even hundreds of ground stations and linking them together across the internet so that they can all be coordinatedly tracking the spacecraft and sharing the data where it needs to be, you can dramatically increase your, your coverage and therefore the amount of data that you download. The current status of Genso, as you heard from Phil, it's partially complete. Um, it's in kind of an advanced beta stage, I suppose. It's going quite a lot slower than, uh, than certainly than I would have hoped back when I was the project manager. Um, but uh, it is still going ahead and one of the key things is they're looking to make it open source. And this is very interesting for us, because once they make it open source, anybody can work on it. And then perhaps we could have a QB50 instance of Genso. And perhaps when QB50 gets all of their, their uh, wonderful funding, they can siphon some off to develop an instance of Genso for QB50. And, and that will be very, very interesting. Um, the pros and cons massively increases the number of ground stations and the, therefore the data. Um, of course, you require the CubeSats to be transmitting more often, which is going to affect their power budget significantly. Um, you need strong coordination. Uh, and it would work a lot better. Again, so it's quite, quite flexible, but it's going to work a lot better if the QB50 CubeSats are all very similar, so that you're not trying to constantly change frequencies and modulations and data formats and blah, 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 blah. Um, but these things that I've highlighted with Asterix, these are, are really quite important system engineering decisions that at the moment our working groups are a little bit worried are not, not being taken or are just being taken by whoever happens to shout loudest the first and it's not really in a, in a coherent way. Um, moving on to talk about band selection. So UHF and VHF, um, of course, they have a lot of pros for CubeSats. Uh, they, they, you don't need attitude control to get a decent downlink. You've got quite good efficiency and low power. Um, they're already compatible with many, many ground stations. They're already uh, set up to work with, uh, with the Genso uh, test software that we have. Um, most CubeSats use them anyway for command and control, so using them for the, uh, for the data downlink, for the payload uh, data downlink, uh, isn't really adding anything extra. Um, the cons, of course, is you, you tend to have very low data rates. Um, but this is why most CubeSats end up using UHF and VHF because S-band, although you can get much higher data rates, you need attitude control, um, which is going to be particularly problematic for QB50 because the high drag is going to screw up your attitude control, especially towards the end of the mission, which is when you really need it. Um, and uh, we were suggesting perhaps you've, you've seen the trick of using a, a VHF antenna as a gravity boom on a CubeSat. Maybe it can be a gravity boom when you're in the high orbit, and it can be a tail streamer when you're coming down much lower. Our point to them is that your attitude control requirements are going to have to be very, very strict. It's going to be quite a powerful attitude control system to keep these things pointed um, as the, the drag increases. Uh, and of course, the orbit's going to be quite unpredictable, which is going to make it harder and harder to point your antennas in the right place. The TLEs are going to be changing faster and faster and faster as these things fall. Um, and you're unlikely to be able to transmit as often because of the, the, the power that it takes, which is why not many CubeSats choose S-Band. 
And at the moment in QB50, I should be clear, they uh, are expecting the, the 50 CubeSats to come from 50 different universities that are developing them for, for free to the project. So you've, really, you've got them making their own choices at the moment. Um, so the, the sensor selection group can't expect them to all put S-band on to get great data down. because The universities don't, don't need it, don't want it. It's too complicated for them to do. The other big data transmission options is whether to just transmit on request. So when the, the CubeSat's over your command station, you say, I'd like some data, please, and collect it. Or if you have it transmitting all the time. Of course, if you're using a ground station network, you don't gain anything if you only transmit on command. You need to be transmitting a lot, which is going to use a lot more power. Um, but we think that's the only way to get a significant amount of data down. So that's what we're probably going to be recommending. Um, so overall, for band selection, these are our, our recommendations from our working group to QB50. To have the CubeSats transmitting constantly while over populated areas um, on UHF. Uh, you're going to have to have some kind of um, onboard data handling with a buffer to keep repeating the latest uh, data so that you don't only transmit data when you measure it, otherwise we're going to never get any data over the middle of the Pacific, for example. Um, so you, we're going to put some uh, requirements on the data handling of the CubeSats. Um, and we want uh, to recommend that they keep the transmission schemes similar so that they all use the same demodulation and decoding and... Uh, uh, and, and the data formats within the packets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, perhaps a few QB50 QB spacecraft could use S-band. Um, out of 50, you'd expect a few to try, and that would be great because um, you can get the higher data rates. And if we uh, uh, talk to the sensor selection groups, maybe they would change the sensors on those particular spacecraft, the ones that they're really interested in, a more dense data set um, they can use to complement the others. Uh, so moving on to quickly talk about modulations and uh, error correction. Um, majority of CubeSats tend to use 1K2 AFSK without forward error correction, of course, um, because it's simple, low power consumption, it's easy uh, to receive and decode. Um, all the ground stations are set up for it. There are better ideas, perhaps. There's quite a lot of better ideas um, if you use BPSK. Uh, um, with forward error correction, you can get much more robust data. You're gaining something like 16 dB in your link budget. Therefore, you can bump your data rate up. Um, but our main point overall, again, is that if QB50 uses a mixture of different modulations and error correction methods and transmission speeds, the complexity is really going to reduce the amount of data received. So it's quite similar to the band selection point. We uh, think that everyone should use the same scheme. Um, we don't know exactly what scheme that is. We've got a couple of action items to, to look into it. Maybe, maybe CDMA, the ISIS guys are talking about. Um, so overall, our recommendations are to, to standardize. Um, we're investigating FEC. We're investigating uh, CDMA. Um, i talk a little bit about wideband receivers, omnidirectional antennas. Um, if we consider the situation here, uh, ideally, once these CubeSats have spread out, you're going to have this string of pearls all the way around the planet. Um, this uh, is a highly idealized picture, of course. These are perfectly evenly spaced, which isn't very likely to happen. Um, but looking at this, the early simulations actually show that they spread out quite quick. Uh, if you've got random deployment direction, because the upper stage is just tumbling, and you're deploying to every orbit, I think, is uh, the, the current uh, idea. If the ballistic coefficients differ by just 10% or so, um, which, of course, they will. If you've got 50 different universities building 50 different CubeSats, of course, they're all going to have different ballistic coefficients. They actually spread out around the whole orbit within a couple of, of, couple of weeks, maybe three weeks or so. Um, at least the fastest ones of... of, of, of well, the. the the ones with the most drag have dropped down into lower orbits and are therefore going faster. So you've still got them quite clumped, but they're starting to spread out nicely. But important to realize that the orbit's only 90 minutes long and you've got 50 CubeSats. That means that the spacing is less than two minutes on average. So in a six or seven minute pass, you're going to have two or three in the sky on average at the same time. That's really hard to track. How do you decide which one to point your antennas at? Um, that's a really difficult uh, problem to solve to make sure that everything is tracked 
that's a, a hard, uh, hard scheduling uh, algorithm for the ground station network to deal with. Lars has got some wonderful ideas about how to do this. Um, one of them is to go to a wideband receiver. Now, we've already heard uh, a lot yesterday about the wonderful uh, Funky dongle from Howard. Um, and this would be quite an interesting way of uh, potentially tracking multiple spacecraft at once. If you have an omnidirectional antenna and a wideband receiver, then you can just sit there recording the whole sky. And you can get the, the you can collect the, the, the signals from all of the spacecraft that happen to be up at that given time without having to choose one, without having to point at anything. And the rest is just software. Decode it later. Obviously, it's a difficult problem to solve. Obviously, that's, uh, that's not simple software. It's tricky to set up, but could potentially use something like this to track many spacecraft at once, which could be very, very powerful for QB50. Um, of course, it means you've got to keep the data rates very low, and that's uh, a massive amount of uh, data to collect. The, anyone who's ever recorded a whole spectrum will know it's a huge amount of, uh, of, of data. Um, and then you've got to decide, do you, uh, do you try and locally decode it? Um, ideally, yes, but this, again, requires all the CubeSats to use exactly the same comm systems. Um, or you need some very complex ground software, especially if you're doing software-defined radio with multiple uh, CubeSats in the sky and you want to try and decode all of them. Um, but if you do the spectrum recording, then it really is a huge amount of data, as we say. Um, it's, it's actually so much that there's no way you could upload it from a normal uh, broadband connection, the data you collect every day. Right, let's show you why. Because with QB50, you actually you lose the point of tracking a single spacecraft. You're not tracking individual spacecraft anymore. Because once they're spread out, you actually want to track the string. You want to track the orbit whenever you're underneath it. And at this altitude, maybe the swath... Uh, the range would be 1,500 kilometers max, maybe. So the swath on the Earth that can see the orbit is maybe 3,000 kilometers wide, which means you're going to go through it in about three hours twice a day. So you're going to have to listen for six hours a day to, if you want to track all of QB50. Um, and it's not picking individual spacecraft. It's just, oh, I'm underneath the string. I'll listen. But if you have six hours a day of spectrum recording, there's no way that you can upload it. Even if you were just doing the baseband audio of a single signal, that's four or five gigabytes easily. So overall, these are likely to be our recommendations. Um, still very preliminary, of course. We're writing up the reports. So use wideband receivers and omnidirectional antennas at a large number of ground stations. Not all, of course. We want the normal tracking antennas as well. Each of the CubeSat teams should have their own tracking antennas. Um, the CubeSat should all have identical transmission schemes, uh, if, if possible. Um, if it's not possible, then we're going to have to be recording the segments of the radio spectrum because we can't decode all of these differing schemes. And a huge amount of data transfer, we're going to need some very, very clever ground software. And this is one of our key recommendations that we really want uh, QB50 to invest in some uh, development of the ground segment. Um, so because we haven't got any fixed requirements from them, we've developed this set of hypothetical scenarios and said, OK, if we do these, these uh, requirements, then this is how much data you'll get. So if we start with the current situation where there's no coordination at all, the, the ground stations will just be individual stations for each CubeSat as normal from each university. The space segment will be complete chaos. They'll all do whatever they want. And then maybe you're going to get 75 kilobytes per day per spacecraft. If you change that a little bit and say, OK, let's at least standardize the communications, and you've got a lot of radio amateurs helping out, such as in uh, Delphi C3, um, but you've still got no, uh, no real ground station network. It's still ad hoc um, volunteers uh, emailing data to each other, this kind of thing. Maybe you can, maybe you can double that. Uh, if you then start to include ground station networking and have a couple of hundred of coordinated stations, 
um, you can make, start to make quite a difference. You're still going to get a lot of duplication of data. Um, you're going to get a lot of conflicts where there's multiple stations tracking the same uh, spacecraft, so the data is uh, duplicated all over the place. But in terms of, of actual um, unique payload data that you can collect, um, perhaps you're up to 400 kilobytes per spacecraft per day. This is per, per, per day per, per satellite. Um, we can ramp up the, the data rate, go to 9600. You're going to get slightly fewer stations that, that, uh, that can receive that. Um, so maybe you don't go up to, uh, to, to four times the, the, the data collected, even though you're at four times the data rate, um, because the number of stations go, go down. Um, perhaps we're going to talk about double, let's say double, um, 800 kilobytes. Uh, if we start to use omnidirectional antennas, things start to get interesting. So imagine that as, as well as the normal um, set of uh, radio amateur stations that are tracking, we have a couple of hundred of omnidirectional stations of, of uh, antennas set up, um, connected to laptops, very low cost, very small, so we can have lots of them quite easily. Um, then perhaps you're going to, uh, we're back down to 1K2 here, of course, because with an omnidirectional antenna, you've not got the link budget to go much higher than this. Um, but imagine this is for now narrow band, so you're still only tracking individual spacecraft on each pass. You can only track the one that you choose to track. Uh, maybe you can get about 600k. Um, but in the best version, if you've got wide band receivers, so you can track multiple spacecraft at once using something like the wonderful Funky dongle, then um, still 200 stations, then you may be up to about one and a half meg per spacecraft per day. And that's starting to get into the realms of something that could be useful for the, for the science team. Um, but as you can see, the system complexity here is really increasing and increasing and increasing with quite a lot of, of requirements upon QB50 that at the moment they haven't foreseen. So this is what we're putting into our report. And of course, some of the CubeSats will have the optional extra of S-band. Um, we'd then ask them to, of course, have their own ground station capable of receiving the S-band. Um, you need to take into account that they then need decent attitude control, um, the, 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 the transmitter's less efficient, perhaps overall DC power on the spacecraft, you can need something like 10 watts to transmit um, and control at the same time. You can maybe only do this for about 10 minutes a day, works out about 35 meg per spacecraft, and I'm sure the science guys are going to jump on that and say, oh, can't we have that, can't we have that for all of them? No, you can't, and if you're going to ask universities to build them for free. So our first report is basically, number one, please assign a system engineering team. That's by far the most important recommendation we have. Um, we'd like them to define a minimum QB50 CubeSat standard so that if you want to be a CubeSat in QB50, this is the minimum standard you've got to meet. Here's the requirements upon you. Um, and this needs to be as soon as possible. The proposals to QB50 for including my CubeSat, I have to give a proposal in October this year. And they haven't been told any of this yet. <laughs> um, we need uh, requirements from the other working groups. Uh, we got some numbers from the sensor selection working group that you heard the other day. Um, that we, we heard the other day that, that you've, you've heard about that are hundreds of megabytes per orbit. Um, obviously, this isn't realistic, but our point is that, that we only got those numbers because we were watching their presentation. They're not in a system level document. There's not a spreadsheet being filled in. There's not requirements being passed around. Um, so we'd like to, to recommend that they start taking this a bit more um, formally, I suppose. Uh, so we'd like greater interaction between all of our working groups and that this interaction shouldn't be uh, with uh, presentations and politics and, and wonderful uh, symposiums where we all tell each other our ideas. It needs to be real technical discussion in the details. Um, so that's uh, basically a, a wrap-up of the QB50 situation at the moment. We're writing up this report. Um, Graham Sherville is the chairman of the, uh, of the working group. Few members here. Um, we'd welcome all of your ideas and input, of course. Um, and uh, I think AMSAT is very pleased to be uh, supporting the QB50 network, at least involved in the early stages. Maybe we can have some influence, make sure that it has some radio amateur content, a couple of radio amateur spacecraft within the 50, of course, is very, very important. Otherwise, uh, they shouldn't really be using our frequencies, should they? Um, so, does anyone have any questions? 
every project has to be a win-win situation for every party. Is this not an opportunity for ASK, the universities, worldwide, to develop the open source algorithm for compression data that we can use? Yes. Could you just repeat the question? Okay, so I repeat, every project has to be a win-win situation for every party. So is this not an opportunity for ASK, the universities, to develop an open source algorithm for compression data that we can use? That could be one way we go, indeed. Um, it would be a, a great opportunity for it, I agree whether we could get the universities to all club together in a coordinated way to agree on this without some central management is difficult. If we could uh, encourage QB50 system engineering to take, take that role, then uh, I think it would be an excellent idea, yeah? I think you have to play the ball back. Mm. We can certainly make the recommendation, indeed. Yeah. Right, another idea. You've got all this data coming in, uh, in via Harrods dongle. Uh, presumably you'd need something like an egg beater antenna. Just, just throwing this up in the air. So we see all these satellites, all the data coming into the computer. If the data from each satellite had a unique header mm -hmm. and also a packet number, yeah. and the computer sorted out which packets were good, which packets were bad, mm -hmm. discarded the bad packets, kept the good packets, go off to a central database saying what packets does the database need and only send the good packets to the data, a central database. You only send the good ones. Yes, yes, yes indeed. Um, that would be ideal, of course. The biggest problem is, is getting the packets because the, if you've got um, a, an SDR spectrum with four or five CubeSat signals in it, get, getting, getting from that to the packets is certainly not trivial. Or to, or to have software that's automatically just going, oh, there's a, there's a vertical stripe, that must be a CubeSat. Yes. I'll, and, and doing this for each of them, trying to avoid the, the crossovers. Well, it's, yeah, but each satellite must have a unique identifier. Of course, yes. yeah. And each packet that that satellite must have a unique identifier. Mm. The computer can sort out what are the good packets, so all this data that it's getting. Then it goes off to a central reservoir or central database to find out what packets that database yeah, yeah. needs. For, for sure, indeed. Yeah. The, the, the challenge, we think, is going to be going from the SDR spectrum to the packets. That's the difficult bit. But then, yes, the idea of uh, how to distribute well, them is a good one. think about amateur radar as a whole, we've already got certain programs that almost do, does this. Yeah, we're not, we're not far off, but I, I think our, our main point to QB50, we, we agree with you completely, but the main point to QB50 is they need to be appointing someone that's, that's going to take care of that. Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's going to write that software and release. This is the QB50 ground segment package that we'd like you all to run on your machines, um, just as the, the Delphi guys did with their decoder. Yeah. Hi, uh, you are going to herd uh, 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 satellites from 50 universities across the world and all ground stations should be able to read all the 50 satellites. <coughs> are you going to make sh how are you going to make sure that uh, all the satellites will comply to the requirements that you are going to give them? Mm. Um, I'd like to be clear on one thing. Uh, I'm not going to. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not here representing the QB50 project. I'm representing this working group that's been asked to advise the QB50 project. And indeed, our advice is <laughs> you're going to have to coordinate it because if they all come out different, it's going to be complete chaos and you're not going to get any sensible science return. It's going to have to be coordinated. Um, so we, we recommend that they, they stipulate um, that any CubeSat that wants to participate in QB50 must fulfill these design requirements. 
and have a minimum set. On, on top of that, they can do whatever they like. We don't want to restrict the universities in what they're doing, because otherwise they're not going to be interested if we just tell them, you have to build exactly this. Of course, no one's going to want to do it. Um, but defining a minimum standard that they must meet, and then I, I presume the project should be then asking them to prove that with tests. Anyone else? Um, one, other, uh, one other odd idea here, Neil. Um, mm -hmm. You've shown the SDR with uh, Howard's wonderful, or should I say Mr. Dongle's wonderful dongle. Um, there's also a piece of um, uh, SDR receiving equipment in the US based on FPGA. Right. At the moment, it's only uh, set up to receive CW, but I've seen it looking at 30 megahertz of spectrum, decoding about 1,000 CW signals in parallel. Wow. If something like that could be rewritten for a different modulation format, that would be perfect. Sounds, sounds brilliant, yeah. yeah. So, uh, as, we, as we said before, the tools are, are largely already out there. The problems have been solved, but it just needs to be pulled together into a coherent QB50 package. Indeed, but it does seem to uh, add the demodulation as well as the wideband receiving, which is, uh, yeah. a, 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 as you say, a major impact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. We'd, Please um, send uh, some details of this. Do uh, you have C any links? Or? CW skimmer is the thing to... CW uh, skimmer. Up. Okay. Thank you. There's Jim right at the back. <laughs> um, I just want to... I know you're not representing QB50, and it's really an overall QB50 question, this, but I just wondered if you care to comment um, how much of this is amateur radio, because it seems to me that it's very much a scientific um, investigation that's just using amateur frequencies for convenience. Have we got any sort of payback? Let me transponder or let me show dedicated you something here. To Is it be we can use. Sorry. To answer this question, uh, so this is our report, a draft, current draft of our report to QB50 management, and we're exactly your point. We're saying, look, the, the, the radio amateur frequencies are for radio amateur applications, and if QB50 is going to use it, you're going to want to use these bands and have the frequencies coordinated in these bands, they can't expect to do so without providing some radio amateur application included, either as a small payload on each of the CubeSats, or perhaps Two, one or two of the CubeSats could be um, nothing to do with the QB50 science return, but, but only uh, radio amateur payload. I believe um, Graham can maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, but we already have verbal indications that that's going to be possible, don't we? Um, probably one or two of the CubeSats could be owls. Um, so, so certainly, yes, that's one of our strong recommendations to them. They have to take this into account, otherwise it's just not a reasonable request. I assume we have to stop the questions at some point because we, I've, I've taken half an hour already and yes. Lars needs to go. So. Carry on now. Maybe one more. <laughs> uh, this is a very quick one. I, I guess you've sort of written off S-band as being not too practical, but you're looking at it from a high data rate. Um, looking at it at a low data rate, um, I could see that you could perhaps have some form of almost omnidirectional S-band transceiver with a few hundred milliwatts of, uh, of output which you could receive with a dish on the ground, a reasonable sized dish maybe. At that point it's starting to look very much like a mobile phone and you've suddenly got all this technology available that will give you CDMA or something to give you your channel applications. Okay, you translate the frequency band a little bit, but uh, I wonder, have you looked at that sort of technology? Um, we haven't looked at that in much detail, no. Um, it sounds like an interesting technical solution to the problem indeed. Um, one of our issues is that, that we're not the ones coming up with the technical solutions for the space segment because the universities are doing that themselves all independently. So we could, we could suggest something like that as a good solution, but there's, when we make recommendations and minimum standards that we want them to follow, we, want, we don't want to, to impact too much. We don't want to tell them, you must have this S-band system. Um, whereas the UHF and VHF, they're going to be using that anyway. And if we say, you just must use this standard protocol, we're not impacting too much. We're not asking unreasonable things of them that are going to, are going to make them want to, to run away from the project and go and do their own thing. Um, so it's a good technical solution, for sure. 
but we've got no real way of forcing all the CubeSats to do it. All right. Oh, there's one. Do we have time for one more? Take, take this one. All right. <laughs> Just put a 3G dongle in each. Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> okay, I'll hand over to Lars. And although we're, we're billed as uh, both talking about QB15, this is actually pretty much a separate subject, isn't it? Yeah, so. completely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I would, uh, just want to present uh, um, one of the um, possible um, uh, CubeSats that are uh, special CubeSats for the uh, QB50 project. Um, GTSat is a Genzo test satellite, therefore I had this test picture on my t-shirt. Some of the students didn't, didn't, doesn't even know this anymore. It's, it's really funny. Um, uh, it's a very simple idea um, uh, that, uh, uh, that had already some consequence on this uh, QB50 work, uh, uh, frequency coordination working group. Um, because the, the um, uh, CubeSats are, uh, CubeSat radios are um, produced by students or by universities, by different universities, and the, gr uh, then the ground stations are also produced by uh, uh, different universities and radio amateurs, they differ much. They are produced by different persons and uh, not all commercial. So they are really, sometimes really, really different. Um, uh, and the, uh, the, the link quality is not that predictable because we don't know what the the, the really the, the, the quality of or the, the link uh, quality to that uh, special uh, that uh, that that cube that uh, will be a link scheduling policy uh, should be optimal to the short of the lifetime of the satellites of the project it's only three months it should be as optimal as possible if we have one satellite uh, seeing two, two ground stations we have to choose which one is the better one which is the higher likelihood to get a, 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 a good data return it would be kind of Nice, but that's that's not only that's only one point. We have also the problem that Niels uh, said before. We had a lot of conflicts: two ground stations seeing one satellite, two satellites seeing one ground station. Mm. There are a lot of conflicts there. We have to to think about conflicts not only on the ground side, also on the on the on the space side. So my um, we had an um, uh, idea that we would do a satellite, a really 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 simple satellite with only two radios on. On it, that's that's more or less all. And we uh, would do uh, something like a, a predefined bit sequence that we really know, send that to uh, uh, to the to be measured ground station, and uh, see what the bits that could be recognized are. But what are the bit flips? What is the bit error sequence? What is the S meter reading? Whatever, whatever we can get, and evaluate um, what is the quality of that ground station for that. Uh, for that, for that, um, uh, um, for that um, communication link, uh, it can be even a little bit more. But this is really a little, uh, more or less scientific, uh, science fiction. It can be even trying to test some protocols if allowed for the QB50 um, 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 for the QB50 project. If we have to use more frequencies, we can even test the ground stations beforehand. To see if the student, or if the universities, if the uh, if the, the ground segment is ready to deliver sensible data to the uh, general uh, the, the, the the database uh, that has been hopefully in place at that moment, so it can be something like a real test scenario before the a real uh, QB50 um, 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 swarm is out to ensure that the things uh, the the ground segments are ready. Um, since we have a lot of ground stations, uh, I think this was a, a graph from Bastian's uh, PhD. He just collected some data from um, uh, the, uh, that, that was available for the amateur radio community. These are all radio amateur ground stations. So there are really quite a lot. So it can be really worth it to make the effort to, to, do, to use that, if possible. If we have a certain link information of what is the 
probability of a link for a uh, for, for a from a radio, we can even introduce try to induce more information into that before we get uh, a sensible data. It can be weather also because you all know that if you have rain outside, if it's thunderstorms or whatever, it's not, not fair to compare two ground stations. One in the bad weather situation, one in the good, uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't be fair. So we have to level that thing off. It, even sun, uh, um, uh, the, the sun cycle is, has to be introduced. Every information you can get, really everything you can get, should flow into that system to make it equalized, not to be unfair somehow. Yeah? Everything you can get. So the, 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 uh, there's a nice um, uh, uh, computer science um, uh, thingy that can help. Uh, if you use support vector machines, these are just giving you prediction models, a model of what will be in the future if you have all this information, including the bit error rate, all these things, um, what will what will be the link predict, uh, what will be the link pr um, um, quality in the future for the next pass or so. It would be quite a nice to have such models. So uh, the issues to be uh, addressed here, the ground station network characters are, are widely unknown. If QB50 wants to use Genzo, for that, they should have lead, at least a little bit of feeling what is the gain by that, if it works. Now we are assuming that the links are completely perfect. We have to schedule them somehow. If they are completely perfect, we have to schedule to make the choices. Which programs to use, which algorithms to use, what to do. Neil said already something about that that uh, we had made some research about it. The, the network load prediction and calculations will never be performed. Neil said also that if we have these omnidirectional antennas, there will be terabytes of data to be transferred on the ground. It's kind of heavy. And the network behavior, when growing in size, that's not only for, for QB50, but if Genzo is growing a little bit, it has to be somehow uh, estimated if you have a centralized server orchestrating Genzo, or whatever network it is, is, how can it deal with the load? How, it's because scheduling is a kind of very hard thing to do. Scheduling and computers, are, uh, and computers is one of the things that makes the, the, the computers fast or slow. <laughs> Windows has not really good scheduling mechanisms, even yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, uh, there were no solutions for centralized orchestration. In the beginning, we even thought about not only a centralized orchestration, so the central uh, uh, um, uh, scaling algorithm, but, but, but also a distributed algorithm. But for, to make it easier, we made, made that centralized. It can be done um, distributed. At the, uh, we, had some, uh, we have some ideas for that too. And some, uh, and no other parameters than pass lengths have to be taken into account for the local scheduling. We made it simple. We just assumed these links are good. That's it. The consensus is, is, is a framework uh, that is uh, addressing this issue. This had been developed, and in fact, we made it open source. You can download it. You can have it if you want. It's really, thank, I think it's worth a nice, nice to have it. Um, we had, and this is now something like a, a graph that, that shows what's the problem. We have here the, the ground stations. This X is just the ground stations. Here, the visibility over the time. The spacecraft sees the ground station over that time. This is more or less the problem we solve. Here we have a lot of conflicts. If you look at it from that side, everything has to be scheduled not to be in conflict. If you see it from the spacecraft, too. Not only from a ground station point of view, but also from a spacecraft point of view. So it's more or less a three-dimensional problem. <clears throat> the result from that, if we, uh, we, we can find a conflict-free solution, it's a packing problem, Rucksack problem called, we will have a scheduling, even if we have a main station and a reserve station, would be even more better if, we, if, the, uh, if the main station uh, is filling off the, off the net, whatever. And this can give us, uh, can, can give us a, a very complex, um, uh, uh, can give a very pro complex pr um, uh, project a certain timeline, what to do when, because of we, and when we know which data can, uh, comes down to the ground when, it can give you something like, a, well, this is the, 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 the time when to commission the spacecraft and so on. So, give a little bit of hint. 
<coughs> in the beginning, Genzo, like it is at the moment, it's kind of very, very, very primitive scheduling. It's just the first come, first serve. Hmm. It's an idea. Some computer, uh, computer systems uh, do even uh, use that. It's, it's OK. You can do some conflict resolution with that, but it's not really clever. Uh, we, had a, uh, implement, we have implemented a random selector. Why do you think we should use a random selector? It's the worst case scenario. This is for sure always the worst case to compare better scenarios. This is the bottom line. And we have also the linear optimization. This is a theoretical approach. Since we know the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the thing here, the, uh, the problem, we can have an absolute optimal solution. This is the top line. But be careful. This is the top for the model we assume. That is what we know about the, 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 the project, which is not completely what is the truth. So then we have some, some uh, artificial intelligence things like simulated leading, random multivector, sequential greeting, bucket filter, whatever. There are some, some, some algorithms that try to optimize that scheduling. And then we've, um, uh, uh, we, we fed the system with uh, 50 um, uh, spacecrafts uh, and about 300 ground stations that, uh, where we got, uh, got the coordinates. This is giving us about six uh, passes per ground station per space of per day that are really um, uh, useful. The average uh, communication time frame of 30 minutes per day, like we had several times. This is giving us about 65 passes per day per ground station compared to 80 passes uh, for common Le uh, LEO uh, satellites. This is a little bit lesser because it's a le very, very, very low uh, orbit. The reason is the smallest com communication higher due to low orbits. And the consequences, the lower, uh, uh, the lower mission return on standard load operation compared to higher LEO. If, if, if you have like, something like, like um, a Delphi C3 or AU, AU CubeSat 2, this is QB50 will have a lower, uh, lower communication horizon, much lower, so a smaller circle. So, and now a little bit of the result that I have already been in a consequence, uh, has already been in a consequence for this uh, QB50 frequency allocation group. Um, the, this is the 100%, the that means this is what, if you ha what you get when you have only one ground station and one satellite. Uh, the past time optimization percentage uh, for uh, a centralized orchest orchestrated um, system can be a little bit different for different uh, algorithms. Now, for sure, the random selector is the worst scenario. It's cool. It's, this is the worst uh, case you can get. Uh? And what is the best? The best was the linear optimization. The linear optimization is that. That the uh, uh, random, uh, uh, that the, um, um, the simulated uh, kneeling is a little bit lower. It's also clear because we uh, just had to turn off the system after a while because uh, evolution strategies and simulated kneeling strategies do use a lot of time, hours, sometimes days. Yeah? And we said, okay, after two hours, this should be good enough. Therefore, this is not that ideal. Funny thing is here that the, uh, the uh, sequential greedy algorithm, as you can see here, is a little bit better than the linear optimization, optimization method. And I gave you already a solution why this is. Because this thing, this, oh, pardon me. this thing is extremely greedy. It wants to have everything it can get. It's kind of easy and very easy to implement. This was, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the similar leading was really hard to implement. But um, this thing is, it's adapting to the reality because we got real data from Arborg and from some, some others, uh, I think from Swiss Q2. This is getting all the, the reality, for, not, not using the model, it's using the reality, what's getting out of the reality. So this is clear why it's a, it can be a little bit better. And this is a nice algorithm for a centralized um, scheduling system that is much, much better than what it's used at the moment. But to give you an, uh, another overview, what uh, the, the reality is looking like for the QB50 project, um, uh, if you have only one ground station and one satellite, you don't have much 
uh, conflicts, for sure, of course you have only one. If you have a lot of uh, uh, ground stations, you get more conflicts due to the ground station. Therefore, it gets something like a saturation effect. It's not true, like a lot of uh, um, uh, um, talks said that Genzo, the more ground stations, the better. No the more ground stations you get a saturation effect. After a while, you get double data. Mm, doesn't fit. So and the same for the spacecraft, because you can only, if it's tracking, you can only track one spacecraft, so a little bit of problem here. For, therefore, for active passes, the more ground, uh, the more ground stations you have, uh, you, you have this saturation effect. For passive pass, that means only receiving. Uh, it's not that, that, that's not that, big problem more. You can download. But if you have an active uh, pass, you have to deal only one frequency at a time because we don't want jamming. The optimization potential that you can gain by such a system like a ground station network that is tracking and using the, the best optimization method is about 5,500%, uh, 5, so 50 times better than nothing. That's really impressive. So you get a lot of data back. Um, <coughs> as, we, uh, as Neil said before, uh, after a while, the, they, these, these uh, um, spacecraft will spread out quite, just, uh, will, be uh, will be distributed quite well, which is a point of view, uh, is, is, is kind, kind of nice uh, for the point of view that uh, you won't have to, you won't have to spacecraft uh, that perhaps trying to use the same frequency because they are not a visibility, uh, trying to minimize the frequencies. But it is bad for the kind of, of rotation. <laughs> you have a lot of rotation for the rotators. So not really good. And uh, um, it is not like that what you see here. It's a, the past term optimization percentage against uh, uh, the ground, uh, ground station amount. This is not completely linear. This will level off also because of these conflicts, because of double data and so. So uh, we made a lot of simulations for that and we have already an open source. It, it, it is a, in, implemented in Java, so if you are interested, you can have it um, solved. So this is more or less the, the results for, for, uh, for some questions we had due to prepare this ground station frequency allocation group. Thank you very much, Lars. We've just got time for two quick questions. Yes. Is there, is there anything that could be done uh, using the existing satellite constellation? So, uh, say, uh, say some of the FM uh, analysis satellites and taking signal measurements for any stations that are interested in uh, joining in. Mm -hmm. It won't, obviously won't simulate the end to end, but, but uh, it might be good for the first order. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.